get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Good morning. Welcome to Zion Church. We're not in heaven, but we're still rejoicing today. We're at Zion, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about as good as any church to be on this earth if we're not in heaven, right? So good to see you all. Welcome to anybody joining us on Facebook Live. We're glad that you're tuning in. I'll direct your attention to the insert as I quickly share with some things coming up. Dave and Kathy McCamey's anniversary celebration is next Sunday, and I share that because the family is inviting all the church family. So it's from 1 to 3 in the Fellowship Hall. There's another family having a celebration in a few weeks. It's a baby shower for Carly Sherman and their baby girl. Uh, the baby shower is September 1st at 3 p.m., here at Zion Church, and they do ask that you RSVP uh, Nicole, uh, and her phone number is on there. Rally Day is coming up September 8th, so that will be our restart to Sunday school. We'll have Cowboys with a mission here. Um, they'll be doing activities with the elementary kids, and then uh, the middle school and high school kids will be up there also, and then uh, they'll break up middle school and high school will go one direction and elementary kids will go another direction for some um, testimonies from some of the young people that are in uh, participants in Cowboys with a Mission and then Kevin Cooley will preach that morning. We will have uh, our barbecue pork and brisket lunch after worship that day. So the pulled pork and brisket will be provided uh, Church members and, and regular attendees are asked to bring either a side dish and a dessert, or you can bring a side dish and a dessert. Ryan Stevenson uh, concert is coming up September 12th. You can read more about that. You can also scan the QR code and buy your tickets uh, just by scanning that code. We will have some hard tickets, paper tickets, if you prefer to do it that way, um, and Don Raven will have those available by next week. We are also coming up with uh, coming up on the, with the beginning of school, our Wednesday night dinners. And we are in need of two more teams uh, for Wednesday night dinners. Right now we have two teams that are going to do once a month. We also have some individuals that will, you know, cook once, but not, they're not going to be regular. So I'd, I'd love it if um, we could have four teams um, and then uh, we, can, we can work those other people in that are, want to do one meal in the fall or maybe one meal in the winter. Also, Kim Lundgren and I would greatly appreciate it if someone would volunteer uh, to be the organizer for Wednesday night dinners so that um, that's not added to Kim and I's plate. So pray about that, think about that. If you would like to be the person that schedules all the teams and that doesn't mean you're necessarily cooking regularly at all or that you're even here, but you're the organizer and the person they call to, and then Kim and I won't have that. Uh, but right now I'm working on that, so if you get a phone call from me, um, I'm currently the organizer, and uh, I will be asking if you might be willing to uh, cook for Wednesday night dinner or maybe get with a team uh, to cook a Wednesday night dinner. Are there any other announcements? I made you all quiet. Let's take a moment to get loud again and greet one another.
Good morning. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, in Jesus, you open for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and strength to stand in Christ, who is our firm foundation of faith. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It's been several months since we have done a moment for missions. And it was a year ago that um, the Smith family were here, Brian and Tara and their three daughters, um, Maya, Claire, and Ava. And I never did learn to tell them apart. But this family served in uh, Northern Africa for many years before returning to the States. And they're currently serving in Orlando, Florida with uh, reaching out to the, the diaspora students and employees at the Epcot Center. And uh, those two gentlemen with them, they're from China, and their names are Alan and Jeffrey, and they are digging into the scriptures. Next slide, please. Uh, originally, their plan had been to uh, work with Moroccans who are at the Epcot Center. Apparently, there is a display at the Epcot Epcot Center on Morocco, but uh, the, the Moroccans have not returned since the end of COVID. Their targets, it seems like God has brought to them the Chinese and Japanese visitors, and that's where their uh, efforts have been. Their outreach tool, they call it discussion and food events, and you can see the picture down there on your lower right. They had 30 people at their house on the for July 4th celebration, fo focused on American food, including s'mores. And uh, many of these uh, Chinese and Japanese had never had a s'more. As you remember, last year when they were with us, they asked one of their prayer needs was for a new house, a, a better place to live. And uh, their prior priorities were neighborhood, neighborhood, neighborhood. They needed to be close to to where their ministry was, they needed schools for the girls, and they needed a place big enough to bring these people together. And you can see, looking at that picture, they were quite successful. As far as prayer requests, um, school starts there on uh, August 12th, tomorrow. So they're praying for the girls as they begin new school. And both Claire and Ava have knee surgery on September 17th. Not a lot of details in the newsletter. And pray for their ongoing Bible studies as they reach out to these uh, groups where the gospel really has never taken root. And then pray for the return of the Moroccans to the Epcot Center to, so they can get on track. And Terry is entertaining the idea of going part-time work, so if you could pray for that. So the le next slide, please. Last but not least, um, you know, Sepang was with us, I believe it was two weeks ago, Sepang Basupi, and he did send a little note, and I will read that to you. Please pray my thanks to the Zion Church community. Thank you for the love offering. That's a huge blessing, and I am grateful. He goes on to say, thank you, Natate and Mama, for having me in your home. And then he says, I hope I can get to see you down here real soon. That invitation is not just for Sue and I. Um, it would be kind of fun to take a group to Southern Africa and uh, visit Sepang and uh, some of the ministries going on. And uh, he's kind of excited about that. And finally on Sepang, um, he has taken on a larger role within AIM there in the Southern region. And he was very nervous about this. They had a vote to ratify him in that position. 
and that during his time here, he was nervous and concerned. Will the vote pass with only one no vote? So uh, that's a positive outcome to prayer. And you are praying for Sepong. Um, you know, he's leading an organization that's going through change, and change comes with growing pains. And often, as a leader, you're blamed for the growing pains. So just pray for Sepong. And I realize that this slide needs a bit of, a a bit of explanation. Um, he helped us turn our Farming God's Way compost pile, and he can really lift a lot of weight. And then um, he had never fired a firearm, so we went out behind the house and opened fire, and he had a blast. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Steve. This morning's call to worship comes from 2 Corinthians chapter, 20 verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Please stand for our opening hymn.
church? What is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for all the students, teachers, administrators, bus drivers, custodians, cooks, secretaries, counselors, coaches, paras, and educational specialists of our schools as those in our community embark on a new school year, grant our schools peace and make them wholesome and pure places of teaching and instruction, training and encouragement. God of compassion, you have given us Jesus Christ, the great physician who made the broken whole and healed the sick. Touch our wounds relieve our hurts, and restore to us wholeness of life. Hear our prayers today for Dick and Joyce Desmond, Dorothy Sherman, Sam Hampton, Matt Mischke, Janine Cirilla, and others we lift up to you in the silence of this time. Mighty God, you rise with healing in your wings to scatter all enemies that assault us. As we wait in hope for the coming of that day when crying and pain shall be no more, help us by your Holy Spirit to receive your power into our lives and to trust in your eternal love through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
Father God, everything in the heavens and everything on the earth are yours. We return these gifts as a sign of our gratitude and as a response to the needs of the church of the world. Lord, bless these gifts. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 142, verses 1 through 7. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift my voice to the Lord in mercy. I pray and pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Just look and see. There is no one at my right hand. There is no one who is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your holy name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Reading. Thank you, Jenny, Jenny T, Mrs. T. Our New Testament reading comes from Galatians chapter 5. Uh, some of you, maybe that uh, play cl close attention, will go, wait, what about chapter 4? Um, so I'm... I admit it, I'm skipping chapter 4. You know what that means? Chapter 4 is on you. Go home, read chapter 4, and write your own sermon. All right? Assignments are due Friday by noon. We're in chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 15. Listen to God's word. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. I really believe Paul was writing with that much, that much passion. Mark my words, he said. Verse 3. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. 
Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. A little metaphor that Paul throws in there right in the middle of it all. It's a metaphor that his audience would have understood. They didn't need any explanation, and probably you can figure it out, especially any of you that bake. What, what the metaphor was, is, was saying was just, just a little just a little tiniest bit of corruption can mess up the whole batch. And, and so what Paul is saying, just the tiniest bit of false teaching, just the slightest false teaching can spread and become part of the whole. And that's what's happened in Galatia. That's what's happened to the Christians in Galatia. The slightest bit of false teachings got in and it's and it's gotten to where it's it's gotten to the whole church the whole church has been corrupted by it verse 10 i am confident in the lord that you will take no other view the one who is throwing you into confusion whoever that may be will have to pay the penalty brothers and sisters if i am still preaching circumcision why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Yikes. Paul, Paul was not a softie, was he? Verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you think of great speeches on freedom, when you think of great speeches on freedom or liberty, what do you think of? Or who do you think of? Can you think of any? Do you think of Patrick Henry the, at the time of the American Re Revolution? Give me liberty or give me... Good, some of you thought of that. Or do you think of President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? Not the beginning, which we're all familiar with, but the conclusion where he says, as he's standing there at Gettysburg, from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Do you think of Lincoln at Gettysburg? What do you think of? If you could read my mind, which might be a scary thought, if you could see into my mind right now, you would probably see Mel Gibson with face painted white and blue on horseback, playing William Wallace. It's not gonna play, is it? Do I have to reenact it? And I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men. And free men you are. What will you do without freedom? Will you fight? Fight against that? No! We will run! And we will live. Alright? Fight and you may die. Run. And you'll live. At least a while. 
and dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Ah, they can take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. Uh, for all those great speeches on freedom and, and any that you thought of, I would, I would argue today, I would put Paul's speech from Galatians 5 up there above them all. And you might say, well, we, you just read that. That didn't seem quite like William Wallace. Quite, but look at it again. I... Uh, and read it again, and perhaps you will after we're finished this morning, and you'll read that speech, 15 verses, and you'll th say, that is, that is, that rivals or beats all, all those speeches on freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Why did Christ make us free? So that we could be free. True freedom. True freedom. We're not talking about a freedom that, that any founding father or American president or, or William Wallace or whoever you want to put up there. We're not talking about that freedom. We're talking about a greater freedom when we're talking about freedom in Christ. We're not talking about freedom as Americans. We're talking about a greater freedom. What Paul makes in this speech here is a speech about true freedom, forever freedom, a freedom that does exist right now. It can exist for all of us and exists in heaven forever. It is an eternal freedom. But alas, the Galatians who he is writing to, they are not living in that freedom. They're not living as free people in Christ. No, they had been threatened by social and religious and organizational forces within their community, and the pressure had been so severe as they were threatened by these people. Do this. You must do this or else. The threat was so real, so strong, that they had surrendered. They had surrendered their freedom in Christ and they had gone back to living as slaves. They had, they had gone from being freed by Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit in the message that Paul had proclaimed to them and leave in slavery to sin, to go in Christ and now what have they done? They've only subjected themselves to another form of slavery. And some of the same things, although we live in different times and in different cultures and a whole different world, but some of the same things that threaten the Christians in Galatia can threaten the freedom of Christians today. Some of the same threats that they faced are threats that you all sitting in Worland, Wyoming may, may face right now. So I want to look at some of those threats. I want to look at four threats as I see it from Galatians chapter 5. First off, your freedom in Christ is threatened when you don't take a stand in your freedom. Paul frequently encourages readers to stand in the face of adversity. The Philippians, for example, were to stand firm as they contended together for the gospel. The Ephesians were to stand their ground when the day of evil came. For the Galatians, they were to stand firm in their freedom. Paul begins by saying, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm in your freedom. Christ gave you freedom. So stand in it. Stand firm in it. Don't let anybody move you from it. 
I'm sure some of you have been watching the Olympics like I have, and in the past several days, the focus has been on track and field, at least the stations that I'm watching, and I'm, I especially love watching the, the long distance running. And, and you see it in the races as they're fighting for position, and you'll see the runner give a nudge to try to get, see if, can I get in here? And, and, and if not, they can't go away. In the same way, Paul was saying, you had run a good race. You were running a good race. He said that in Galatians. You were running a good race. Who cut in? And just like those runners in those long-distance races, having to, as they're moving, running their race, keeping a firm spot, saying, I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to let you push me over and take this spot. I'm staying firm in my position. In the same way, Paul was saying, stand firm. You were running a good race and you gave in to people pushing you around. He's saying to them, there's still time to stand firm. Stand firm in your faith. Same is true for us. We have to stand firm in our faith. We have to stand firm in our freedom. It is a tragedy, in, even in modern times, that many people gain their freedom from sin through Christ, and they turn around and they volunteer for another form of slavery to a religion or cult. They go out of the frying pan and into the fire. In the context of the Galatian church, the believers were freed from sin and then they gave themselves over to a yoke of false teachers who would weigh them down with laws and rules and regulations. When you know Christ has liberated you, stand firm in that truth. Stand in your freedom. And then stay standing in your freedom. No one. No one. And no religion. No cult. No leader no matter how charismatic or captivating he may be, can tell you what you have to do and what you can't do. You have freedom in Christ. Stand firm in Christ. And you stand firm in your freedom. Secondly, your freedom in Christ is threatened when you substitute legalism for grace. Legalism alienates people from Christ. The New International Version translated verse 4, you are trying to be justified by law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. The English Standard Version translates the following way, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. Whether it's alienation from Christ or severed from Christ, the message is the same. Legalism cuts you off in, from your relationship with Christ. If you think about it, as Paul describes it, legalism is an abusive relationship with a religion or within a religion. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul said religion alienates you. Religion severs your relationships. If you ever have experienced an abusive relationship or if you've seen loved ones in an abusive relationship, you saw how that happened. How they, they severed relationships. They cut people off from family, from loved ones as part of the abuse. Religion becomes an abuser. And people are targets of that abuse. The legalism, if you've ever been associated with it, if you've ever been tied to any form of cult-like religion, you know that it breaks you down. It beats you down. It makes you feel terrible about yourself. And legalism does alienate you from the one who truly loves you. That is abuse at the hands of religion. And I'm not making light of domestic abuse. I'm not making light of, of any type of abuse, physical, sexual, mental, emotional. But neither should I or any of us look lightly on legalism. 
and cult religions. Whether it's in a church or an organization or in a family. It's harmful. It alienates people from Christ. And that's what's happened in Galatia. So no wonder Paul is so, so strong with his words in chapter 5. He knows that this legalism is abusing the Christians, these young people. And I, I think he's being so direct about the abuse of circumcision and the improper use of the law by those Judaizers against the Galatians because it breaks his heart to see these young Christians, young in their faith, not fully mature Christians being abused by legalism. And they've even come to surrender to that legalism. I don't know what types of churches everybody grew up in. I don't know all the different teachings or doctrines you were exposed to early in life, but I do know that any time a person is exposed to a legalistic religion or a works-based religion where you earn your standing in the church or you earn your standing in the cult by, by observance or strict obedience to the rules and the rituals and the social expectations of that group, it is often something that stays with a person for a very, very long time. Some people who are able to leave such legalism still carry the pain or the scars or even the mentality of some of that abuse that legalism brought upon them. The good news is God offers us grace, healing grace, loving grace, compassionate grace. The good news is Jesus gives us freedom in place of that heavy yoke of slavery that comes from submitting to legalism. Thirdly, your freedom in Christ is threatened when guilt or merits are the rulers by which you measure your own worth. The Judaizers were trying to enforce a performance-based righteousness. Again, in chapter 5, Paul has returned to one of the primary performances being shoved upon the Gentile believers, and that is of circumcision. We talked about it a lot when we were in chapter 2. Judaizers are guilting the Gentile Christians into circumcision. Paul says that it's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that matters. He says that, that neither has any value to, to righteousness. So what does have value for righteousness? And Paul gives the answer, just this, faith expressing itself through love. And while this letter was aimed at the Gentile Christians, I wonder if Paul hoped that some Jewish Christians would get the message too. For while they were guilting people into works-based righteousness, they themselves thought they had gained, already gained their own righteousness through their own merits. Our relationship with God is not a meritocracy. Our position in the church is not based on our merits. Now, if we're being honest, I suspect for some of us, that's a hard pill to swallow, if we're being honest. I mean, especially as Americans, we're a meritocracy uh, in so many things. Uh, and maybe it's not just Americans, maybe it's just human nature, probably part of the sinful human nature that makes us want to earn it. I got to earn it, right? There, there does seem to be some deep seated mechanism in us human beings that yearns for a system through which we can gain or earn everything we have and everything we attain, including our goodness and our righteousness. We're performance based so much. So maybe it is, even in the church, sometimes hard for us to say, 
it's not about that. So, Pastor, are you really saying my confirmation didn't earn me any points with God? But I memorized all those questions and all those answers, and back in my day, we went two years to confirmation. And, and I memorized all those scriptures, and I stood up in front of the congregation, and I was grilled. Are you saying that that has no value for my righteousness? Yes, that's correct. It had no value in making you righteous or more righteous. What about my 50 plus years as a member of this church? It has an increased value to my righteousness. All the events I helped plan, all the vacation Bible schools I assisted with, all the food I've cooked, all that cabbage I've cooked. None of that has advanced my position with God. That's exactly correct. No value in making you more righteous or righteous in the first place. What about my tithes and offerings? Don't tell me. Yeah, that's right. No value in making you righteous. Then tell me, what does have value? How can I know that God loves me and that I do love God? Paul says the only thing that counts, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. But that sounds too simple. It sounds too easy, doesn't it? And that's, I, I can do that every day. That's true. You can. I can. We can. Once you have that right relationship with God, which is a gift of God's grace, it is God's grace that makes us righteous. And once we have that righteousness, it flows out of your life. It flows out. It, it's, it's what we do. And, and your faith and love is expressed for God in worship and in corporate worship. And so that's why you want to be here as often as you physically possibly can be here. That's why you're here. Not out of obligation, but because you desire to be here in worship. Because why? Because it flows out of your righteousness that God gave you. You want to thank Him. You want to glorify Him. You want to worship Him. And your faith is, and love is expressed by reading His Word and meditating on His Word and, and praying daily, often. Talking to God often throughout your day. Not because someone's making you, but you do that. You spend time in daily devotions not because you have to, but because you want to. And, and your faith and love is expressed through acts of service. Yes. So, so you do things within the church like cook for others on Wednesday night and help out with vacation Bible school and, and do youth ministry and sing in the choir and sing in a praise team and teach a Sunday school class. You do those things, not because someone's making you, not because the pastor called you, but because it's flowing out of your life. It's flowing out as a result of God's grace, that righteousness you want to serve God. And that includes in the church. Your righteousness, which God gives you, results in your faith expressing itself through love. And then to emphasize that he is not contradicting the law, Paul throws this in at verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We know Paul didn't come up with that. Jesus gave it to us. It sounds a lot like Jesus in Matthew 22. When an expert in law asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus gave him not just the greatest commandment, but he gave him also the second greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said this, On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The law was never, ever fulfilled in legalism. It was never fulfilled by performance. It was never fulfilled by people's merits. 
it was fulfilled in God's love for us and given to us ultimately in his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever has faith in him, would live forever. Now the fourth and final threat to your freedom as shown in these verses is this. Your freedom in Christ is threatened when you think that it means that you are free to do whatever you please and whatever pleases you. Verse 13, Paul writes, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Christian liberty is not a license to please the self by doing whatever pleases you in the moment. True Christian liberty, unlike the various freedom or liberation movements of the secular world, is not a matter of demanding the rights we have. Uh, perhaps inadvertently, our founding fathers of America, for all their wisdom and all, they, all the good they did in, in drafting and designing the framework of our nation, inadvertently triggered off a, distortation, a, a distor, distortion excuse me, of Christianity by speaking about our, our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, the Christian, on the other hand, realizes that before God, he or she possesses no rights at all. In our sinfulness, we have forfeited all our rights. The Christian, the Christian is free, truly free, in Christ. And it's not about our happiness or our pleasures. Instead, having our freedom secured in Christ, our pursuits are to love our neighbor and to serve one another humbly in love. Robert Brewer Young is um, a contemporary uh, cello and violin maker, uh, probably the, the most famous uh, and well-known, ac most accomplished violin maker of our day, still alive. He has clients all over the world. The best musicians, if they want, they want the best violin, they look up and contact Robert Young. He has clients uh, that are musicians from the New York Philharmonic to the San Francisco Symphony to the Berlin Philharmonic to the Opera National de Paris, just to name a few. He once said something about, about a violin string that is apropos to Paul's words on freedom in Christ. Robert Brewer Young said this, I have on my table a violin string. It is free. I twist one end of it and it responds. It is free. But it is not free to do what a violin string is supposed to do produce music. So I take it, fix it in my violin, and tighten it until it is taut with no slack. Only then is it free to be a violin string. By the same token, a human has freedom to just be a human apart from Christ. A man can be born and can live all his days free and die free on this earth, however he pleases. But that freedom is not true freedom. That human can be free to do what he pleases with no strings attached to God, but he will never be what he was created for. His free existence will never produce the life music that he was intended to make as long as he is apart from Christ. But once he is fastened to Christ, once his life is attached from one end to the other. 
to Christ. Then, alas, he is free to be what he was intended to be. And you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, Son of God, you have promised us that if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. Send your Spirit to us this day, either to remind us of the freedom that we have in Christ, or to make individuals aware of what true freedom looks and feels like in their lives. Send your Holy Spirit to each of us this day that we might live in our freedom and live out our freedom in and through Christ. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.